Thank you so much, Professor. Hello, good evening. Nice to see you. My name is Gaku Funabashi, as I was introduced now. And I came from the university called International University of Japan that is located in Niigata. It's about one and a half hours from Tokyo. And now I teach this at the Graduate School of International Management. So I teach management, like uh, courses like strategic management, and my expertise, uh, original expertise, is small and medium enterprise development and industrial development. So I also teach the courses related to SMEs, small and medium enterprises, and industries, as well as some kind of social business. And today, what I would like to talk about is the industrial development, mainly talk about the, the Japanese industries, and related to this industry, I would like to explain about the Japanese management because some industries which Japanese enterprises could get the competitiveness in the past are closely related to the, the characteristic of the Japanese management. So that is something I would like to explain. And I have only three issues. And I will talk about for about 40, 45 minutes, and if you have a question, I'm more than happy to answer all your questions. And the third part, Kaizen. Do you know this word, Kaizen? Does anybody know Kaizen? Oh, oh, okay, not many. Kaizen, it's about the quality control and productivity improvement. And I will explain a little bit more because that is also related to the Japanese management. And to begin with, uh, with only one slide, I just want to talk about this. Why I wish that you learn something about the Japanese experience today, about the Japanese industrial development and the management. Is there anybody who study business? Okay, several. Now, in business management, you study theories and some frameworks to analyze the business. And why we, first we need to learn these theories and frameworks. Now, each enterprise has different characteristics. And even though you apply the theory, sometimes you fail in your business. Then why it is necessary to learn such kind of theories and frameworks? There's some principle that probably using that principle, the, the possibility of success in the business will be higher. Definitely there is some principle. But why sometimes it doesn't work? Because of the environment. External environment where the enterprise compete because it has been changing and if you don't modify your business, your strategy, based on the changes of the environment, of course, the possibility for the success will be lower. So, for the successful business, you need to think about at least two things. First, to understand about the principle to make the possibility higher. At the same time, you need to know how to modify based on the changes of the environment. And today, because the time is limited, I would like to talk about the, the principal part, especially the principle that we can extract from our experiences in Japan. So this is the base. And of course, after knowing the principle from the Japanese experiences, it doesn't necessarily mean if you apply it in Georgia, all the enterprises in Georgia will be successful? Maybe not. Why? Because the environment here and Japan are different. And some social context behind the enterprises and the behavior of the people are different. So again, after knowing the principle, if you think about such kind of social context and the features of the environment in this country, then if you combine them, maybe you will find some 
necessary steps that you need to take for the successful business in Georgia and, of course, Georgian enterprises in the world. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the Japanese industries. One question to you. There are three kinds of industries. Which type of technology Japanese farm, Japanese enterprises have strengths? Computer, car, or this is a chemical plant? What do you think? Which one Japanese enterprises has strengths? Cars, yes? Anybody? All of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> but unfortunately, not all of them. <laughs> Class, yes. Car, yes. Computer, it used to be, not anymore. Because of the, this changing the environment and changing the technology, characteristic of the technology. Chemical, not quite. But it has been changing again. Before, Japanese chemical industries did not have competitive, international competitiveness, but gradually it has gained. It's gaining. So I will explain why there's some differences. Some industries got competitiveness, some others not. Here, this shows International Competitiveness Index, uh, how we calculate, like the here, export minus import divided by export plus import. Very simple uh, calculation. And by calculating this, you will get this index. And if you have studied economics, not the management, maybe you had with a different name, trade specialization index, but here, I will call it competitiveness, International Competitiveness Index. And you can see automobile, car, electronics, like a computer, as I said before, it has strengths, and steel industry. Those industry are somehow Japanese enterprises have competitiveness. But you can see the chemical industries, this, you know, the figures, close to 0.0. .0. <laughs> A little bit, sometimes below zero, sometimes above zero, but not much. So uh, it shows clearly that the chemical industry in Japan did not have the international competitiveness. At least they didn't, they couldn't export much. And why this kind of difference happens? Because of some characteristic of the technology of each industry and the way Japanese organization, enterprises, manage influences. If the Japanese management fits to the characteristic of the industry, they gain the competitiveness. If not, they didn't. So uh, the first thing I would like to emphasize, this is this, fact, this is something happened in Japan, thinking about the Georgian industries, thinking about the characteristic of each industry, what kind of management features do you have, and how you can fit to the difference of the industry. That is something you need to think about. And the characteristic of the technologies that Japanese management fits so that it has, it gained the competitiveness, mainly three things. One, comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness, if we think about the components, how many components are used in a car, not EV, but uh, the car with gasoline engine? Do you know how many, approximately how many parts? 40,000. 40, yes, close. Uh, before we said 30,000, but sometimes have 40, nearly 40,000. 
So, so many parts are used, and you no know, engine and wheels and steering and some other part, different kind of using the sometimes electronics, sometimes mechanics, sometimes different. So different kind of technology are combined and form as a car. That, so that is why we call it comprehensiveness, comprehend different kind of technologies and put it together to make one product. Second characteristic, coordination necessity. Again, because of the comprehensiveness, because so many parts are used with different technologies, different technologies, when it's combined, the coordination between like electronics technologies and mechanical technology should be you know, connected so that it works smoothly. That kind of coordination necessity are the second features. And the third, progressivity. Progressivity, once you make a product, you can improve day by day, like improve the product itself gradually, improve the quality, and also even the production process, you can improve. That kind of progressivity by the people working in the factory or in different, like R&D, are possible. So, there are mainly three kind of characteristics in these technologies. Comprehensiveness, coordination, necessity, and progressivity. And many industries that uh, the Japanese enterprises could get the competitiveness in the past all had these characteristics. Electronics industry, like a computer, I said before was good for Japanese enterprises, not anymore. Why? Because before electronic products had these characteristics. The technology itself had been changing and we call it this type of product in, with integral architecture, computer or the electronics products. Before, it was a kind of integral architecture, but it has been getting the different. We call it modular architecture. What is modular architecture? Here we have computer. Now, sometimes you use the mouse. You buy computer and mouse separately. Even though you buy it separately, you can use it for, no, you can use this mouse for any kind of computer. Why? Because the way you connect the mouse to the computer, always the same shape. Always the connection are the same. There are some kind of standard. With this kind of features of the product, we call it modular architecture. The more the products get in this kind of modular architectures. It's possible for any companies in any country to produce such kind of product as long as they can invest in the production facilities. So that is why many emerging countries are getting the production uh, center for such kind of modular architecture product like electron electronics products but not the car, really. So, uh, these are the characteristics. And again, electronics, this is all products. You are the young people, so you never seen this product. Do you know this product? You know it, you know it, oh, okay. But young people, yes? The pro The process of? This process, changing from integral to... Ah, commoditized computers, but the... I mean Dell, Dell yes, but the Dell, Dell themselves didn't create that, that, that shape, the modular architecture. 
the, the because not not because of not because of the the way that Dell produced the computer, but because of the the feature of the product itself had been changed. Architecture had been changing. That is why. And this is an old product, and it is called videotape recorder. You don't use it anymore because you when you want to watch the movies, you don't have to use the tape. You don't have to record it, but you just download it on your smartphone. But before, if we want to watch the movies or TV, we have to record and watch it with this kind of device. This VTR, we call it VTR, it's a kind of strange product because there are more than 10 Japanese enterprises developed and produced. Besides Japan, in the world, do you know how many companies could produce? In Japan, more than 10. In the world, do you know how many companies could produce in 1970s? Ten? Two? Hmm? Four? Two? Four? Ten? Thousand. Huh? Thousand. Thousand. Oh. You are very close. Only one. Yes. Besides Japan, only one company in the world could produce this. Philips. Dutch Philips. Why only one company when more than 10 Japanese companies could produce it, could produce VTR? Because VTR, it is a mixture of various kinds of technologies like precision machinery, magnetic recording, IC, electronics, image, imaging, digital technologies, and so on. So, again, I explain comprehensiveness and coordination necessity, two of three characteristics of the technologies. Electronics products used to have this kind of characteristic before it was fully digitalized. That is why Japanese enterprises had competitiveness, but not anymore because it was digitalized and now you can download it. And if you look at the inside the device that you download the product, you can see IC tip and some other electronics components. So now those companies which can produce this IC tip and also the device itself have the strengths, not the Japanese enterprise anymore. And progressivity. If you take production management or professor's course on operation management. Maybe you heard about this. Progressivity or another word, incremental innovation. You have a word, we have a word innovation, but there are several kinds of innovation. If you have Apple's iPhone, when Steve Jobs introduced iPhone to the world for the first time in 2007, people never saw such kind of device. No, doing operating like this, never saw it. People thought, oh, this is the new product with radical innovation. No? If you can create something totally new, we call it radical innovation, but innovation, we can also use it for incremental innovation. Incremental innovation, again, you can improve gradually. That is also the part of the innovation. And progressivity and incremental innovation are almost the same. So if we look at, this is the factory of the car, Nissan, here, you can see some part of the car. This is not uh, the place in 
no, in, in, in this city, I forgot the name of the place, uh, what was the name of that area, where many workshops, Nissan. Isani, this is not Isani, but Nissan factory, <laughs> look like similar, that you can see something similar in Isani, but different, <laughs> no, the people are working, and sometimes, these people working at this factory, if they have some ideas for the improvement in their working process, they can suggest and they can change. And they can improve. Maybe the productivity will be higher. That is also one of the incremental innovation. Again, with ideas from on-site staff, they improve. Looking at the plant of the chemical industries, here, this kind of plant, once it is built, it's a little bit, not a little bit, it's very difficult to change the process of the plant. Even some staff have some ideas for the improvement. And that is why chemical industries, because this industry did not have three characteristics, one, it's a kind of has a comprehensiveness, but coordination necessity, yeah, somehow it has. But third one, progressivity. Didn't work, didn't have such kind of characteristic. That is why Japanese management didn't fit to the developing this kind of industries. In a nutshell, here, this side at this kind of factory, Learning by doing, not staff do the operation and get some ideas, immediately improve it. And sometimes because staff are doing, actually, for assembling the car, they learn how to be better. And through the operation, if they can gain some knowledge to improve the productivity, that means they learn by doing. And for those who study business management, business administration, and if you took the strategic management course, now there are some issues in strategic management. One of the important issues is the resource, using the resource, internal resource. And this learning by doing is one critical part to accumulate such kind of resources. I will talk about that later. Here, that is the theory. Resource, it's called resource-based view. This is just a review of the strategic management. Resource-based view by American professor. His, his name is Jay Barney. He is uh, the most famous uh, scholar in the resource-based view. According to him, there are four things which is critical for gaining the competitiveness. His framework is called Virio framework, V-R-I-O. What is V? Value, valuable. If you have the valuable resource which can bring you economic value, that means profit, one, resource. The second, rare resource. Now, you can imagine some kind of rare metal. No? To get the, that kind of rare metal, maybe it's a little bit difficult because you can get only from the limited area. If they have such kind of resource, that's the rare resources. But that is not only the material. Rare resources, sometimes you cannot see. But if you have such kind of you know, resources, which is rare, which can be the source of competitiveness. And the third one, in, in imitable resources, inimitable, what is the meaning of inimitable? What is the meaning of inimitable? Yes, exactly. Cannot imitate. If others, have difficulty to imitate 
that some other people, that, uh, some other companies does. That means the, com the, the competitiveness that one company has cannot be imitated by other companies. This company, which has inimitable resources, can continuously make a profit using these resources. Why I explain this? Inimitable resources, you can gain only through learning by doing. If after the graduation of this university, you start working for, let's say, the private enterprises, and you want to suggest your boss, CEO, how to gain the competitiveness. If your CEO said, okay, this is very difficult task, let's outsource that because there is another company which will do for us. Then you can tell him or her, the boss, we cannot gain any inimitable resources which can be the source of competitiveness. We cannot win the competition if we outsource that part of the business. If you don't do it by yourself, you never gain such kind of resources, which is inimitable. But if you can gain some knowledge through learning by doing, nobody knows how you gained it because only you know, because you did it. Then in that case, that can be the inimitable resources. So, have a mechanism within the organization so that you can learn by doing that is one important part for gaining the competitiveness. And from here, I want to talk about some characteristics of the Japanese management, how the way the Japanese and many Japanese enterprises conduct the management fits to gain such kind of learning by doing in imitable resources. One important keyword is information sharing. Information sharing, for example, within one organization, let's say Farm A, there are several divisions, marketing and production part in the factory, research and development, and some other department. In many Japanese enterprises, the people in different department, unit, share the information to create something new. Maybe it sounds natural. You know, as a student, maybe you share the information with other students. Tomorrow, we will have an exam. This professor, last year, uh, she had this question. Two years ago, she had this question. If you share this kind of information, maybe the possibility that you can get higher points will be higher. This kind of information sharing is important to achieve something higher. Here, again, coming back to the Japanese enterprises, within the organization, they often share the information. If we look at the American company, it seldom happens. Why it seldom happens? Because in many American companies, people are hired for a certain job. And let's say, you are hired for the production. You are hired for the research. You are hired for the marketing. And those people, because their task is to do something for that part of the business, they seldom share the information from other part of the enterprises. Japanese enterprises, when you are, let's say, you will work for the Japanese enterprises, when you start working, somehow you are told maybe you will do this job, but after some years, it's possible you are transferred to another department. This kind of job rotation 
it is possible. And it happens quite often. Because we have traditionally this kind of job rotation, they, people experience various kinds of jobs within the organization, and they get to know the people, different people, when they are transferred to different department. And even though after they go to the different department, they know the people who, who worked in the same department before, it's very easy to share the information. Again, why Japanese enterprises had the strength when the technology had the characteristic of comprehensiveness and coordination necessity. You can imagine, when you coordinate something, what is important? You know the people, you share the information with other people. It is necessary to coordinate. With this kind of information sharing through job rotation or the loose boundary of the specialization within the organization, it's more easier. And that is why coordinating, connecting different technology, it was more easier for the Japanese enterprises, not American enterprise. And the comprehensiveness, not coordinate and put in together to have a comprehensive product, it was more suitable. That is why they had the strengths with this kind of characteristic. And sometimes they coordinate, they share the information, not only with the people within the organization, but with different organizations, different enterprises. Sometimes with the supplier of some components, sometimes with customers, getting the customer information, sometimes with other companies providing some other, like a production machine and so on. So, this kind of information sharing, even sometimes with the competitors. Maybe you think it's weird that they share the information with the competitors. But if we look at, like a VTR I introduced, steel, or semiconductor, do you know the semiconductor industries, Japanese enterprise had the strengths before, until the beginning of 1990s, not anymore but we had. And for these industries, for research and development, especially for the fundamental research to find out the core, very important core in technologies, some enterprises get together, form some uh, laboratory together with uh, the, the coordination by the ministry. They had a Core research and development. That kind of you know, the information sharing happens. So again, with this kind of information sharing, they learn even through this information sharing. Then they had strengths with three characteristics of the technologies. And Here, again, I will explain why that was possible. This is a comparison with the Jap Amer American companies. First, let's talk about American companies. Usually, when some people gain the knowledge, ideas, this person, do, they don't stay in that organization. They quit the job and join another company or they start their own company. And using this knowledge and technology, they will start the new business. That happens quite often in US. While in the Japanese organizations, many people, it has been changing, but still, many people, once they start working for one organization, they tend to stay in that organization for a longer period, sometimes 20 years, sometimes 30 years, and within the organization, again, 
they share the information. So, uh, because people stay in one organization, it's more easier, and, and because of the job rotation, because of the loose boundary of the specialization, it's more easier. U.S. enterprises, because they spin out, another player emerges. And one example of this kind of difference, this is one company, Japanese company called Murata. Maybe you never heard about this company because they produce electronics components like that one. But when they started the business, when this company was formed, established, their original business producing something like this. If you see the electronic pole, electric pole in the street, it uses some kind of ceramic like this. They started the business by producing ceramic. But gradually, they added the new knowledge and combine with their original technologies and gradually improve the products. This is a kind of progressivity, incremental innovation. And in the end, after some decade, decades, they reached from the ceramic, simple ceramic products to very complicated electronic products. Here in this case, as technology advanced, the same company remain and they improve the technology. So in the case of Japanese enterprises, Japanese industries, main player in one industry remain and improve. But in US, the main player in certain industry has been changed, replaced, and new player emerge. Well, for for the, the semiconductors, maybe you know Intel, but long time ago, which company was a major player in this industry that was GE? Then it was replaced by Texas Instrument, now Intel. So US, in US industries, the, the player changes, replaced, but in Japan, it remains. The same players, but they improve. There's a big differences. Why there's a big differences? Because of the way they manage the organization, and that includes the, the custom for the employment. And one more, because today I was asked to talk about Kaizen, the quality control and productivity improvement. Before I talked about Kaizen, let me explain one characteristic of the Japanese management, which is also related to the quality control and new product development. There's a supply chain, you know? For example, the car. Toyota does not produce all kinds of components. Toyota, they get the components from many suppliers producing the components. They get some, yeah, this orange one, let's say it's a supplier. Suppliers supply components, they produce a car. These suppliers not only providing, supplying the components, parts, they also participate in the new product development, new model development. Here, there's some differences. Just connect it with arrow. Upper side, it's overlapped. Why it's overlapped in the new model development? There's a different kind of processes, but those different processes are conducted simultaneously. And in this process of the development, new products, even the supplier participate, not only the, the engineers of Toyota. What is the benefit that it, 
Toyota invite the suppliers in the, the process of the development. Because suppliers, anyway, for the new model of the car, they have to design the components, the parts, especially for this new model, and supply. So if they participate from the beginning, they can design the components and provide uh, the design to the development team of Toyota. And Toyota can think about such kind of design and create their own products. This kind of overlapping of the processes and participation of the suppliers and with this kind of system, that is why they can shorten the time, lead time for the development of the new model. Usually Japanese companies, they need it about 20 months before they get the new model. American companies, 30 months. European companies, maybe more. But American company, they use more digitalized technology for the new model development. Even though they use more digitalized advanced technology, not computer-aided designing technologies, Japanese enterprises could do it within the shorter time because of this kind of characteristic. And it was possible because they invited again the suppliers. And it is possible because Japanese organization has a kind of organized market. What is organized market? Usually market mechanism, you know, if the company want to purchase some components, maybe they will do the bidding. And the companies which can provide at the low cost with a certain quality can get the right to supply. Organized market, of course, before they join, supplier join in this organized market, they are examined very precisely. But once they join the market, now they can have a longer relationship with Toyota, Nissan, or Honda. And because they can expect the longer relationship, they can continuously provide, supply the components. They have the incentive to invest in the production facilities to improve the quality. And they have an incentive to participate, to contribute to the, even the new model development. So this kind of characteristic of the Japanese enterprises also benefited besides those three characteristics of the technologies. And from here, let me talk about Kaizen within the five minutes. So you have a Q&A session after five minutes. Kaizen, again, Kaizen is a quality control and productivity improvement. And why Kaizen? That is a Japanese word. Is there anybody who studied Japanese language? Yes, what is the meaning of Kaizen? Yeah, Im improvement. Kai, kai means change. Zen, change for better. Kaizen means changes for better. And again, the quality control, not only controls the quality, but improve, improve the productivity. But even Toyota, they are famous with their Toyota production system. But their Toyota production system, do you know, first they imitate it they get the idea from American company. I tell it very secretly. What kind of system they learn? Do you know US company Rock Lockheed? They produce aircraft. No, Lockheed, air, air, aircraft company. In 1954, they introduced one system called supermarket system. Supermarket. No, at supermarket, when you go to the supermarket, you get the basket and go to the, each shelf and get something you want to buy. No, you go to the shelf yourself and get the thing. That is the supermarket system. No, when the producer of one product 
uh, one wax in process, go to the place where they can get the components and get the components and assemble it. That is the supermarket system. Toyota learned from this supermarket system of US company Lockheed and later created their own system using the base idea and that is the Toyota production system. So it is not the original idea from Toyota, but one important thing, but not only Toyota, many Japanese enterprises, they first imitated from company in different countries, like US, Europe. Later, using this idea, concept from different countries, created their own system, their own products. That is the way the Japanese enterprises develop the businesses. Maybe Georgian companies, they have unique idea. Some, in many cases, they get most of the technologies from foreign countries, but it doesn't matter. First, no, most of the Japanese enterprise started with imitation. But the important thing is, after you gain ideas, technology from different countries, you create your own system or your own products. Then you can be unique. Uh, again, uh, how Toyota became create that unique system, Toyota production system. Here, I put six years, two years, zero years, two years. What does it mean? First, they tried to introduce the original type of the system in one process, in one factory. Not the whole factory, only one process of the factory. And they spent six years until they complete, they totally created new, their own system in this process. Then, then they expanded to different processes in the same factory. Maybe you consider they could you know, develop this system immediately and expand it to others. No, they spent six years only for one process. Then expand it to other processes in the factory and to other factories of different companies and gradually expand it even to the suppliers. So, six years, two years, zero years, two years. I want to emphasize this initial six years. They needed so many years to create. The reason why many companies try to imitate Toyota production system by learning from many books about Toyota production system, but still have difficulty to fully apply the system concept is because they don't try to, most of the companies don't try to create their own system which is suitable for their companies. Like Toyota, they spend six years. If they want to have their own system, they have to spend more time thinking about what is the problem they have to solve, how they can solve, using some concept from Toyota or some other companies. That is the way they can find out the suitable system for themselves. And one more, talking about the productivity, I talk about Kaizen, but Kaizen is not the only thing to improve the productivity. Here, value-added productivity, I should say value-added labor productivity is a kind of mixture of physical productivity and value-added part products. What is physical productivity? No. Let's say Toyota, they produce 100 cars a year. There are 100 staff working for the production. Then, how many cars one staff produce per year? 100 cars a year, 100 staff, then one staff can produce how many cars a year? One, yes. So, in this case, physical productivity, one. Value added per product, that is the value, the price 
per product, one product. So, again, if you want to see the productivity, usually many people calculate value added labor productivity, but value added labor productivity is a mixture of physical productivity and value added per product. And there is an order that you have to pursue if you want to improve this productivity. Here, maybe it's a little bit small, but can you see the red line? Red line is value added labor productivity of the whole automobile industry in Japan from 1960 and up to the year 2000. There is a constant improvement. Then the blue one, blue line, is physical productivity. Green line is value added per product. You can see sometimes blue line contribute to the improvement of value added productivity. Sometimes green line, especially here, after 1980s, contributed to the improvement of the red line. So, if you want to improve the productivity, there are several ways to improve. Sometimes, like blue line is necessary, sometimes the green line is necessary. If, we, if I talk about how the Japanese automobile industry developed, in 1950s and 60s, it was blue line, but especially in 1950s and 60s, it was because of capital investment for enlarging the capacity. That is the main factor for the improvement. 1970s, it was Kaizen, that was the most critical part for improvement of the productivity. 1980s, apparently it's a green line, so it's a value added per product. Again, if you, when you start working for the companies, if you think about how you can improve the productivity of your companies, think about this order, capital investment, Kaizen, not first Kaizen and later capital investment. First capital investment, then Kaizen. For improvement of the value added per product, it depends. Maybe you can do it simultaneously as a capital investment or maybe together with Kaizen. So that is something I wanted to emphasize talking about the productivity. Here I don't explain. For those who are interested in making the research for your, you know, uh, for your thesis, for the graduation in the future, and if you are interested in making the research on the industry, industrial development, this is how I, when I analyze the industry, what aspects I will look at. If you want the material, just, uh, just ask the professor. I, you, you can get uh, the material. Okay. So please, uh, yes, please ask her. Uh, she will share the material. And again, uh, there are various factors, not elements we will look at, but basically only three. First, market demand. Demand factor, that is important. Where is the demand? Second, technology factor. I explained about the characteristic of the technology. So, technology part is important. But when I talk about technology, maybe you think it's only about the manufacturing industries, but it's not about the manufacturing industries. When I have a course on the development of Japanese industries at my universities, I include banking sector. And I analyze the banking sector with this framework. Even talk about the technologies. Because even the banking sector uses the technologies. Well, the manufacturing sector, they have an input and they have a pro output, uh, a product as an output. Banking sector input is money, output is money, but it's not the same kind of money. So any kind of industry, even the service industry, if you want to analyze, 
you can use this. And the third uh, the factors is competition. Competition factors, including external environment. If you think about these three, you can look at very you can find out some interesting result from your analysis. So uh, now this is uh, the last slide. This is a question that I want to ask you before I close. What kind of principle does unique industry in Georgia have? I explain about some characteristic and principle that works, that the Japanese management fits. How about the case of Georgian enterprises? Maybe you have some interesting social context for information sharing. If you do something that you have been doing traditionally, that can be the source of competitiveness because with that kind of social context, you can do the information sharing. For example, yesterday when we had a dinner with some people, I heard about some tradition in Georgia. You have a party. What was the name of the party? Uh, Supra. Supra. And I heard there is a person who lead Supra. Tamada. Tamada sounds like a Japanese name, but uh, Tamada. Supra and Tamada. In, I don't know, maybe young people consider Tamada is a kind of uh, like a boss. I, do, I don't like that kind of person. But maybe with this situation of Supra, you share the information, various kind of information with other people. I'm not sure if it is true or not. Uh, that is the information I got within these two, three days in Georgia. But if you think this way, what do you have in Georgia? And sometimes you consider it's trivial, it's just a traditional things, but if you combine them, and think about the management, how you can share the inf information within the organization. Maybe that is a way that Georgian enterprises get the competitiveness in the future. So that is something I would like you to think about. And maybe you can apply that in other industries too. Thank you so much. Now I'm ready to answer your question. But please do not ask me about Supra. I don't know anything about Supra and Tamada. Any question? Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, do you think with, uh, do you think, uh, with this kind of specific uh, progress uh, that the Japanese use for uh, any industry they're in. Uh, do you think it's going to be gaining a competitive advantage or losing a competitive advantage what for the future? You mean that if Georgian enterprises are... No, no. Are uh, Japanese enterprises, do you think, with this method, kind of Kaizen method and incremental progress, are they for the future... Uh, going to gain competitive advantage or disadvantage, ah, do you think? I will show you one example. I said chemical industry, that was an industry the Japanese enterprise could not gain the competitiveness in the past. Now the situation has been changing. The material which is necessary for producing the semiconductor, some chemical materials, some Japanese enterprises dominate some part of the chemicals used in the semiconductor. They dominate that. And why they could gain such kind of competitiveness for specific materials? Because to make this material, they apply three kinds of characteristics. Comprehensiveness, coordination necessity, to combine some materials, coordinate, and to have one material, they gain gradually 
improved and finally could develop this material. So to gain the competitiveness in the industry where they had weakness, again applied three characteristics and gained the competitiveness. So that is why in my first slide, I show principle times environment. Principle, I believe that we shouldn't abandon, we should stick. But the environment, environment has been changing. Using the principle that Japanese enterprises have strengths, changes based on the external environment, then probably even in the future, they can continuously having the competitiveness. That's something I think. Did I answer your question? Okay. Any, <clears throat> any other question? Yes, please. Hello, thank you for your presentation, first of all. And um, don't you think that so uh, in Japanese companies, when people don't have that much, uh, that much specialization, isn't that a problem nowadays? Especially when, in, uh, for example, American companies, people are really specialist in, uh, even um, for a little detail, they are a person who do it so with a high success. And don't, don't think that it's, ah, it's a you, problem? You mean the, the Japanese enterprises employ the people and those people have the job rotation, maybe cannot have a strength with one specialization. Yeah, 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 exactly. I see. That is a very interesting question, and that is important. So that even in Japanese enterprises, one staff has some specialization. Let's say they, they studied mechanical engineering in the university, and maybe half of, half of their em enterprise life in one company Maybe they, they used mechanical engineering knowledge, but half of the time they will explain different uh, unit. And this is also good for this specialization because if they work only in the mechanical engineering all the time, they gain only the knowledge about mechanical engineering. Sometimes if you add different perspective, you will gain the different idea and knowledge. That will also help to improve the technology in mechanical engineering. As Joseph Schumpeter more than 100 years ago said, innovation is from the combination. So if you want to create something new, innovative products, ideas, and technologies, sometimes you need to bring something from the different world and combine it. That is necessary. So specialization is important, but adding the new technology for improving that specialization is also important. Thank you. Uh, any other? Yes, please. First of all, thank you for a really interesting lecture uh, and for the part when you talked about the difference in Japanese and US-based differences in management, which I think is a result of mentality of work ethics between the, and the difference between these countries. Yes. Uh, and if we talk about Georgian market and how to put it into practice, I don't know which mentality do Georgians have. And if we want to put that into practice and obtain in Georgian market, what can we do to push this mental? Should it be pushed from the government or the individual mar or individual CEOs of the companies should do it? I see. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. no, now, we have a guest from the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Japan, and I don't want to criticize anything about the government, but talking about, he's not from the Minister of you know, uh, Economy, Trade, and Industry, he's from the Foreign ministry, so I can talk about something about the industry. For the industrial development, if we look at the, the past experiences in Japan, sometimes ministry try to make the comprehensive plan and they think they are correct, but in the end they find out it was not correct. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes ministry 
uh, international trade and industry at that time did something good. Uh, for example, the coordination for the, the fundamental research, not asking some enterprises get together and do the core research and development. That was a good uh, coordination. Sometimes not good policy. So, again, when we think about industrial development, what you have to do is how private enterprises want to develop their businesses. That is most important because they have some images that they want to achieve, that they have some customers they want to sell their products. And private enterprises, industries know more than the government in that case. So they will make a strategy. They try to do something, start something. Sometimes if there is some support from the government that help because always capital and human resources are needed. Capital, if there is not enough capital from the banking sector or from the different sectors, maybe the government can help. Human resources, in the past, 1960s and 1970s, one of the factors, the Japanese machine industries, electronic industry could gain the competitiveness. One reason, because the supply of the human resources from the university, measuring engineering, electronics, electric, the actual number exceeded US. The, the population in US almost doubled. But the number of the supply from the university in these fields, more than US. So this was a kind of support from the government. Both are necessary, but first, maybe the, the ground design should be made by the private industries. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, any other question? I know some of you have some class classes from 630, so we don't go beyond that um, time. My yes. question yes, is, please. my question is about Japanese Keiretsu. Yes. What do you think? Uh, some authors stress that Keiretsu were very influential in economic development post-World War. And uh, others say that this is just some kind of myth and not reality. What do you think about ah, Keiretsu? I see. Thank you. Sometimes, thank you for your question. Uh, when the industry in Japan was not so matured yet, there are some, of course, some industries have to work together and support each other. In that case, uh, having this kind of keiretsu, keiretsu is a kind of, uh, not the conglomerate, but under the same name, uh, they have many enterprises. Let's say Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Sumitomo, such kind of conglomerates before was separated and have many enterprises. And Again, when the industry is not, was not so matured, different enterprises from different industries have to support each other. And within this Keiretsu, there was a bank, main bank. And they were the main source of the capital. And they helped to the growth. They helped the growth of enter enterprises in the same group. So, Definitely it works before, but as the time goes on, sometimes uh, this carrot, uh, because they try to work with some enterprises within the same group, sometimes they miss some opportunities for the new businesses. And that is why in the modern era, they have some problem. Even in the economic recession era, this banking sector in the Keiretsu, if they stick to one bank, and that bank has some problems under the economic uh, recessions, they cannot help the, the enterprise in the group. And that is one of the reasons why many industries in 1990s in Japan had a problem and lost the competitiveness. So, uh, answering your question, yes and no, in the past, yes, definitely some, there is some time which worked 
that this kind of shape of the, the group of the enterprises worked. But uh, at the same time, in different uh, period, it became a kind of obstacle, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, what time do you start the next class, Professor? 6.30? Not mine. Not mine. <laughs> yes, please. Hello, and Hello. thank you at first. It's a very interesting lecture, for, especially for ESM students, business yes. students. Uh, at first, I have a question that you, many, uh, you th um, said that uh, for um, companies which produce USB and those services, USB and cables, they uh, have standard and they sell those um, devices to all, everyone and it's very profitable for other for them because they sell to everyone and why does it work for apple that uh, it produces different usb and these things and still it's very demanded and what do you think would it would it be better that if uh, Apple started uh, selling standard USB and those things? Mm -hmm. uh, let me clarify your question. So, uh, for, for example, for the product like a computer, the US USB and USB, those uh, even though yes. you buy the USB from different companies, you can connect it. Uh, yes, and those are standards, yes. but Apple produces so uh, different. Ah, I see. Uh, yes. Uh, for example, Apple produced, and they use a different OS, no operating system, and that is very risky. Apple yeah. can have their own system and standard because they have already established some kind of brand name. And even in the past, 1980s, Apple was the first company which started selling the personal computers, the home computers. Before that, you know, the computers was only for the large enterprises or, or the large organizations. So because they were the kind of, you know, in, uh, the, the first comer in the industry, they could uh, introduce some standard. And somehow they could establish the brand name and they can keep it still. But uh, for most of the enterprises, without such kind of brand name, or brand images, to keep their own standards, it's very, very risky. And that is why most, of, most other enterprises cannot have such kind of you know, their own standard. Only one company or two companies can do it. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yes, but if Apple sell, sold um, standard USBs, yes. person who uses Samsung or um, other devices would, sell, would buy it and it would be more profitable that uh, when uh, that, um, it produces USB, which is uh, only for iPhone. Uh -huh, I see. But uh, for example, for, uh, for the, the standard product for iPhone, uh, maybe that is used only for iPhone, but I if we look at the, the global market, how many people want to have iPhone and use the iPhone, there are certain number of the group. And if we look at the size of this market, there's a certain size, and even though one company produced specialized, uh, standardized products only for Apple, still, they can expect the certain size of the market. So again, when I show here, I, I said three important things. One, demand factors. When you look at the demand, when you look at the size of that uh, target market, if it's big enough, there is always a chance for the business. And talking about the standardized products like USB only for the Apple, looking at the market size, still it's big enough and it, it works, it pays uh, in the end. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. you? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Professor Funabashi, for your very interesting lecture. I have 
One question. Um, as Japan remains an export-driven country, what are the three main comparative advantages of Japanese experts of industries and now as of today and what they were, let's say, 20 years ago? Uh, your question is what are the... Comparative advantages, yes. Comparative advantages. Comparative advantages. Advantage, yes. What kind of comparative advantage... Yes. Japanese, Japanese industry has in international market, exactly. Ah, I see. Thank you. And maybe you expect I said first automobile, but I'm not sure about this. <laughs> because uh, the environment has been changing uh, surrounding automobile industries. It has been changing very rapidly. And that is why I am not sure if they can keep the comparative advantage. But as I, uh, when I answered his question, uh, uh, somebody's questions, now, I said the chemical industries before it doesn't have a comparative advantage. Now, it's gaining for certain materials. If they stick to the principles and try to modify themselves so that they can utilize this principle, they can continuously utilize this principle, the strength of the Japanese management three, with three characteristics then probably even in the future, it can keep the comparative advantage, competitiveness. But if they just try to apply some different uh, operation, like uh, US or from Europe, and just import it and introduce it in the, the organization, most probably they will lose the competitiveness. They, will not, they cannot keep the comparative advantage. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for your participation.